Uh, today, as you well know, we are welcoming Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the world-renowned economics professor, best-selling author and global leader in sustainable development. Professor Sachs joins us today live from America, where he works as the director of the Centre for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. But before joining Columbia, Professor Sachs received his BA, his MA and PhD from Harvard University and served as a professor there for over 20 years, most recently as the Gallian L. Stone Professor of International Trade. And Professor Sachs has authored and edited numerous books, including three New York Times bestsellers, The End of Poverty in 2005, Common Wealth, Economics for a Crowded Planet in 2008, and The Price of Civilization in 2011. Professor Sachs was the co-recipient of the 2015 Blue Planet Prize, the leading global prize for environmental leadership and he has been twice named among Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders, with Time calling him the world's best economist. The New York Times calls him also probably the most important economist in the world at the moment. So we are truly fortunate to have a person of such standing join us today. Now, colleagues, you know that our event is being held ahead of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, which takes place in Glasgow later this year. Climate change and sustainable development are two of the biggest challenges faced by humanity. Universities and colleges have a key role to play in tackling the climate crisis and promoting sustainable development through their teaching and research. And we're proud to say that the University of Highlands and Islands has a strong focus on sustainable rural development and conducts cutting edge climate change research. So it's fitting, therefore, that Professor Sachs talk will explore the role that universities can play in tackling the climate climate crisis and promoting sustainable development. And I'm sure you'll be fascinated to hear the insights from him on how we can address these issues and also the key role our university can play in this area. Now, following on from Jeffrey's talk, there will be a panel discussion shared by UHI's Professor Stuart Kibb, with speakers Sharon Felger from NHS Highland, Des Thompson from Nature Scott, and Timothy Cornelius from Global Energy Group. We also invite you, our audience, to interact by asking questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which will form the basis of our audience question session. And our newly appointed rector, Dr. Fiona McLean, will conclude the event. But before I hand over to Professor Sachs, I would <coughs> like to extend a, pref a special thanks to Dr. Betsy Parker as the sponsor for today's event and without whom it would not have been possible to bring it all together. So thank you very much, Dr. Parker. And now colleagues, would you please join with me in welcoming Professor Sachs to give this year's UHI annual lecture. Vice Chancellor, thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm really uh, deeply honored to, to be with you, uh, most grateful. <clears throat> I want to be with you in person, and as soon as uh, this uh, uh, awful COVID <laughs> is uh, more under control, I'm, I'm looking forward to the chance to visit uh, UHI uh, in person. I know it's a magnificent uh, uh, place and uh, um, so interested in being uh, in person together with you. And I'm delighted that we have a chance to brainstorm, uh, as you said, uh, Vice Chancellor, on the eve of COP26. Uh, it does seem that all roads uh, lead from Scotland and back to Scotland. Uh, not only are you celebrating the uh, 10th uh, anniversary uh, and happy anniversary and happy birthday to UHI, but I could say we're in a kind of a 245th anniversary as well. <clears throat> 245 years ago, in your neighborhood, uh, at university, uh, in this case, uh, Glasgow University, uh, a very clever uh, inventor, James Watt, created the modern world uh, and created the reasons uh, why we're going to COP26 after all. Uh, of course, in 1776, he made the steam engine, which is the perhaps the single most transformative invention, maybe in human history, if you say single uh, invention. Of course, he was improving on Newcomen's uh, 
uh, steam engine, but he uh, made such an improvement that he invented uh, the modern world economy, uh, the industrial age, which would have been completely impossible without the steam engine. Uh, and uh, uh, Glasgow uh, was the site, uh, and Scotland, of course, uh, was the site of another uh, notable event uh, 245 years ago, the same year. Uh, that, of course, was the birth of uh, my uh, profession, uh, the economics profession in its modern guise when uh, nearby uh, Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. So not bad uh, for getting us started uh, on uh, this new world of wealth and steam and, of course, fossil fuels. Who knew? Uh, who knew what was going to happen? Uh, it. It was actually about 120 years before it was realized by Svant Arrhenius, the Swedish Nobel uh, chemist in 1896, that what Watt had set off uh, of tapping fossil fuels, coal first, then oil, and then in the 20th century, natural gas, would actually change the planet not only economically and socially, but also uh, climatologically. In, in 1896, uh, Arrhenius said, with all this coal that's being burned, uh, we are going to have human-induced global warming. He didn't use those terms. Uh, that, that would uh, take another 80 years, but he said that humanity would warm the planet. And uh, using paper and pencil, because uh, he did not have a a uh, climate computer model at hand, he figured out uh, pretty precisely how uh, much a doubling of CO2 would indeed uh, raise global temperatures. What he didn't get right was the time scale, because he said this would take place over 750 years. And in fact, uh, it was uh, uh, it's going to turn out to, to be uh, uh, roughly from his calculations, uh, about 150 years for the CO2 doubling to occur. Uh, and so we are really uh, in this uh, extraordinary moment when the uh, steam engine and the birth of the modern industrial age uh, is forcing us, uh, whether we like it or not, to have a new uh, I'd say a new energy age, uh, an age of zero carbon energy. Uh, and we return to Scotland in COP26 to ensure that the whole world gets the message and makes a real uh, and decisive commitment uh, to this change. Well, what Arrhenius told us has uh, come true uh, most painfully and much faster than we imagined. And we know that as of uh, 2020, we had already warmed the planet relative to the pre-industrial temperature by about 1.2 degrees Celsius. More alarmingly than that, as the recent Working Group One report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, made clear last month the rate of warming has been running at about 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade, meaning that since we are at 1.2 degrees C warming already, we have less than 20 years on that uh, rate of increase before we hit the 1.5 degree upper limit that was agreed by all 196 signatories of the Paris Agreement in 2015. But the news is actually even worse than that, because what we are also seeing is not only a continuing warming, but an acceleration of warming. My colleague at Columbia University, the great climate scientist James Hansen, estimates that we are now at a decadal rate of warming of perhaps 0.36 degrees Celsius, twice 
the rate of recent decades, which means that perhaps by 2030, we will breach the 1.5 degree C upper limit that the world set itself just six years ago in the Paris Agreement. The situation is dramatic. We have seen upheaval all over the world. We just had the uh, Hurricane Ida in the United States, which made landfall in Louisiana and then swept through uh, a large swath of the eastern states, ending up with a massive deluge in my city, New York City, many, many people dying from flash flooding in New York City last week. People living in basements uh, that flooded suddenly uh, and people drowning in New York City. And we lost dozens of people in this hurricane. We have heat waves that are unprecedented in intensity in the U.S. Northwest. We have forest fires. Uh, around Lake Tahoe and many other sites of the West, which has been on fire for weeks now at extraordinary proportion. And all I'm saying is that what's happening in the U.S. has been happening all over the world this year, combined with all the other upheavals, COVID-19, uh, the uh, conflict zones in Afghanistan and elsewhere, we're being overwhelmed by these shocks. So we're coming to COP26 in just a few weeks at a truly urgent, maybe one could say even a desperate moment. We procrastinated a long time because this is 29 years after signing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 and we didn't act. The United States was uh, one of the real malfactors in this because we have greedy companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron and other fossil fuel companies. We have a lot of states that produce coal uh, and uh, somehow uh, our politics was unable to cope with these powerful vested interests, even as we are suffering from ever intensifying climate disasters. And even till today, one of our political parties, the Republican Party is almost entirely in thrall to the fossil fuel industry. And we're gonna have critical votes on climate change in just a few weeks. And it's an open question how that is going to go with all of this disaster and emergency in our face. It shows how greed and short-sightedness, uh, really nastiness, uh, and a corrupt politics that we have, because there's so much money in U.S. politics, uh, can uh, threaten uh, us and the world even till this moment. Well, let me say what I think should happen uh, at uh, COP26 in, in my brief remarks today. There are five points that I would like to emphasize. First is we need at COP26 all regions of the world, every country of the world, to commit to net zero by 2050 or sooner. This is the starting point. 2050 is our only chance to stay below 1.5 degrees C. It may well be insufficient to accomplish that. But if we can get to net zero by 2050 or sooner, even if we breach the 1.5 degree limit in the short term, we can return to below 1.5 degrees C by the end of this century. And all of the science and all of the dangerous feedbacks, the melting of the permafrost, uh, the uh, loss of sea ice, uh, the change of uh, reflectance or albedo of the planet, uh, the uh, incredibly dangerous disruptions of the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland tell us how urgent it is 
to make every effort to stay below 1.5 degrees C. Now, much of the world has taken this goal. The United States has taken it uh, by uh, presidential decree of President Biden, but not yet implanted in real legislation. Uh, and that's coming up for a vote just in a few weeks, as I mentioned. China has committed to net zero by 2060, and we need to urge China uh, to uh, speed up the timeline, uh, to uh, not uh, put into motion some of the coal-fired power plants still on the books uh, for opening, because China needs to peak and move decisively to decarbonization faster than 2060. And there are other regions and other countries in the world, especially the fossil fuel producing nations that still haven't committed. So the first thing we need to do in the weeks still leading up to COP26, and we'll have a UN General Assembly uh, in a couple of weeks in New York. We'll have uh, the uh, G20 uh, in Rome at the end of October. Uh, and then the arrival at COP26, we need to pull out all stops for global diplomacy and global politics to get universal commitments to zero by 2050 at the latest. Now, just to say the technology pathways to accomplish this goal are increasingly well understood and a very important report of the International Energy Agency net zero by 2050 issued this spring shows it can be done with the technologies that we have in hand. Zero carbon electricity, electrification of transport, electrification of heating of buildings, and electrification of industrial processes or the use of clean electricity to produce hydrogen and other green fuels for industrial processes. Of course, there are areas for technological advance still needed for the hard sectors, for aviation, for ocean shipping, and so on. That's my second point. We need global R&D programs to speed the innovation, the development, and the adoption of the new technologies. But we are close at hand to having the tools that we need to decarbonize if we can find the political will. So number one, net zero by 2050. Number two, a globally coordinated and cooperative research and development program for improving the zero carbon technologies and for addressing the hard sectors, with, whether it's heavy transport, or whether it is metallurgy, for example, steel making, uh, where hydrogen seems that it can play a major role, or some of the other difficult sectors. We should combine the technologies we have with a major investment in new research and development. The third area that I would stress for COP26 is the full incorporation of land use into the national plans and the net zero by 2050. Land use and land use change are major contributors to the greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, if you add in emissions from agriculture and from deforestation and take into account not only the carbon emissions, but also the methane and the nitrous oxide emissions, then it's estimated that the land use and land use change sectors account for perhaps 25 to 30 percent of all greenhouse emissions. Most of the attention to date has been on energy decarbonization. That's understandable because CO2 is 70 percent of the human induced global warming. But we cannot get to net zero, and we certainly cannot hold to the 1.5 degree C limit unless we have a comprehensive approach across 
to greenhouse gases and a full incorporation of land use together with the energy transformation. This is called for for so many reasons, even beyond climate change, because as all evidence is telling us, we are also destroying the habitats of much of biodiversity on the planet. And so stopping deforestation, reforesting, <clears throat> reclaiming land area with regenerative agriculture is not only critical for the climate change uh, agenda, but also for the conservation of biodiversity, which is in such threat and which itself is the topic of global diplomacy in the weeks before Glasgow at the Kunming COP15 summit of the Convention on Biological Diversity. The fourth point that I would like to put on the table for our discussion is development finance, especially in this context, climate finance, but I would say more generally sustainable development finance. The gap between the rich and the poor in this world was wide and widening even before COVID-19. But COVID-19 has blown a hole through the development process. Developing countries, especially poor countries, have been set back years, potentially decades, by this disaster. They don't have the wherewithal to go to the capital markets to borrow to finance the recovery. And even as the rich countries are spending trillions of dollars on coping with COVID, the poor countries are tightening their belts and even facing the threat of imminent financial crisis and debt crisis. The rich countries have not delivered in the meantime on their now 12 year old promise that by 2020, there would be at least $100 billion per year of official development financing for climate action. Now, mind you, $100 billion from the rich world is just not a lot of money because it is, uh, first of all, much most in the form of loans, and it is part of a $100 trillion world economy. So it comes to one-tenth of 1% 1 of world GDP. But shame on us in the advanced economies that we have not even come up with that 100 billion for the developing world, which needs the financing and is suffering from the onslaught of climate disasters that they did not cause, but are being visited upon those countries by the historical emissions of the rich world. So, I believe that the next months, because this won't happen in uh, full measure, certainly by Glasgow, though advances can be made, I believe that in the coming months, we need urgently a, a new covenant, I might say, on development finance to enable the developing countries to surmount the current crisis to finance the major investments needed to achieve the sustainable development goals and to undertake the energy and land use system transformations needed to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement objectives. The fifth and final point that I would like to make is related to this, and that is that in addition to development finance, we ought to focus honestly on a special category of financing that in the jargon goes under the label of losses and damages. Losses and damages mean the hundreds of billions of dollars now each year that are incurred in damages from ongoing climate-related disasters that have been spurred, provoked, and intensified by 
human-induced long-term climate change. We've always had weather-related disasters, to be sure, but they are coming with more intensity and more frequency than ever before. And they are being visited upon countries that contributed almost nothing to the rise of greenhouse gas concentrations, and yet are bearing a heavy price, a disproportionate amount of the damage. The small island economies around the world are paradigmatic. The countries in dryland regions that are seeing massive losses of food production uh, and threats of famine because many dry ecosystems are becoming even drier. Well, there is a category called losses and damages under the Paris Agreement, which says that these losses need to be recognized and helped, whether it's through new forms of climate insurance or direct payments and grants uh, to help rebuild or to help prevent such disasters. But the rich countries, because of their power in the Paris Agreement, said, don't blame us for these losses and damages. We recognize them, but they're not our historical responsibility. Like those little messages, we bear no responsibility, no liability. Well, that's nice to declare, but it is both factually wrong and ethically wrong and practically intolerable because the rich countries do bear direct historical responsibility and the poor countries need help. They need help urgently. So I want to put as my fifth point, the losses and damages on this uh, uh, most special plane. It is part of finding a path to justice in our world. Let me say in conclusion that not only is, is it historically appropriate that we return to uh, Glasgow uh, on the occasion of COP26, it's extraordinarily encouraging to me to, that we do so. UHI exemplifies uh, the Scottish spirit of uh, solving problems, uh, finding a path to sustainable development. James Watt and Adam Smith uh, display the Scottish genius uh, at this, uh, two creators of a modern world that has added so much to our world. We need some more tinkering. We need some more problem solving. It wouldn't surprise me that it comes out of a workshop at UHI the same way as Watts Engine came out of a workshop in Glasgow. But I think uh, we can all uh, take uh, delight in the fact that the world will come together in Glasgow with the opportunity to set a new path, a new course. We've lost a lot of time, but we still have this crucial moment where we can make things work. Thank you so much for enabling me to share a few thoughts with you today. Thank you and happy birthday to UHI on your 10th birthday. Uh, and I hope you'll keep open an invitation for me to visit the campus in person sometime soon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sachs. That was a wonderful presentation, and I can see you're getting a round of applause both in the chat line and with the the usual <laughs> emoticons. Um, it, it is wonderful that you uh, are here and provide us that um, terrific lecture, and I was particularly taken by the five points. I think they're easy to remember, and they certainly do align with the thinking that you've um, uh, articulated through many of your articles. And thank you also for making the connection um, over those 240 years uh, through um, James Watt. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether you've got enough time to take one or two questions before you have to race off, but I'll, I'll hand over now to our MC, which is um, uh, Professor Stuart Gibb, who will handle the one or two questions before you need to leave. But thank you again for your annual lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Todd. And, and Jeffrey, it's really good to, to see you again. And thank you uh, for taking the time to share your thinking with us in a really thought provoking and really focused uh, presentation. Brutally honest um, and very timely as we're, as we're taking steps towards uh, COP26. 
I, I think perhaps the significance and universal challenge of what we're discussing today is reflected in the range and diversity of the audience that we, we got. It's really encouraging. And from what I can see from the participants list, we have people with science and engineering backgrounds, conservationists, people interested in health and conservation, and those with legal and financial interests and policy and planning. So we've got a really appropriate audience. And it's not only universities that are represented, but the agencies, NGOs, and I think really importantly, interested and engaged individuals. And I can see from, from the, the list, we have people from across the islands and islands, from around Scotland in the UK, and we also have uh, people with us today from as far afield as Turkey, Serbia, the United States, South America, and, and Australia. So everyone's really welcome uh, today. And if you do have further questions, please just pop them up on, on the chat line. Um, Jeffrey, we've already had a, a few questions submitted. So if I can start with a, with a fairly, well, on the surface, at least a fairly simple one. You said that we needed to take uh, new paths, new paradigms, and this is around finance and land use, etc. We've had questions raised about the appropriateness of the term sustainable development. Does it still have resonance, or should we be looking at other terms that better convey where we are and what we need to do? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me say, I, uh, I uh, still love to fly under the flag of sustainable development and, and together with uh, uh, my uh, long standing uh, colleague in this, uh, Dr. Betsy Parker, uh, who uh, uh, also is uh, um, on, the, on the line. Uh, and working together with me in the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, uh, we uh, think that sustainable development uh, is the powerful organizing principle for global action. But what does it mean? Uh, in my view, it means three things, that uh, we want economic prosperity, we want social justice, and we want environmental sustainability all together. Uh, and so uh, if Adam Smith gave us the wealth of nations, uh, I would add the well being of nations uh, alongside that. Uh, of course, when uh, Adam Smith was writing, increased wealth and increased well being uh, went uh, uh, so much hand in hand. Uh, and no doubt, uh, Adam Smith, uh, as uh, the author of the theory of moral sentiments would have been the first to agree that what we really want is not wealth, but well-being uh, in, uh, in our purpose. I think sustainable development is the right concept. It's a holistic concept that says we need to keep the three dimensions of social life, the economic, uh, the justice, and the uh, environmental dimensions all in view and all in concert together. There's an advantage, which is that the whole world has agreed on that idea, which by itself is important political capital for us, because it's very hard to get global agreements on anything. But the world has agreed on the idea of sustainable development. And the Paris Climate Agreement says that we, the signatories, will address the climate crisis in the context of sustainable development. Now, the question is, and I, I won't uh, belabor the point, so we can also get to a, another uh, question, but is it feasible? Is sustainable development feasible? The answer, I believe, is yes, but it requires transformations in how we do things. For example, moving from a fossil fuel based primary energy system to a zero carbon primary energy system. It requires techn technological transformation in how we farm, in the land use, in the organization of cities. So it's not simply development that is more, it is a transformative process. But what sustainable development bids us to do is to keep in mind people's real economic needs for healthy diets, for safe shelter, for education for children, 
which much of the world still today does not enjoy, together with the social justice maxim that no one should be left behind and no country should be left behind, together with the environmental sustainability. Yeah, that's great. It, it opens up a couple of other questions that, that have been raised. Um, the final comments you made there uh, take us perhaps back to a speech that Robert Kennedy made in, in 1968, at, I think it was at the University of, of Kansas. Um, and you probably know where I'm going with this. this I, I know. It's one of my favorite speeches. <laughs> he, he outlined why gross national or gross domestic uh, product was insu an insufficient measure of the success of a country. Just to, to take a, a quote from a touch. Uh, and for too long, we have seemed to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. A gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising. It counts the destruction of Redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. Given the time, it counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads and armoured cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. Yet, it does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, the intelligence of our public debate or integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our comparison. It, in fact, it measures everything in short, except for that which makes life worthwhile. Are we still slaves to GDP? Do we need to start thinking about our progress in other metrics and other measurements? And how how do we best measure and evidence progress in sustainable development? Yeah, that that speech is one of the most remarkable speeches by one of uh, the most remarkable politicians in uh, modern American history, uh, who of course uh, was assassinated just a few uh, weeks after that speech, uh, actually in 19, I, because that speech was given uh, University of Kansas in 1968. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he was my formative, my, my first political love, I would say, I was 14 when, when he was killed. But what he says is not only so eloquent, so correct, uh, that gross domestic product, as he says, is everything except that which we hold important. I, I wouldn't quite uh, put it that way. Um, of course, I wouldn't have the eloquence uh, that Robert Kennedy uh, had uh, on that occasion. But it's surely the case that GDP is not a measure of well-being. And I, I had the privilege, uh, by the way, as a young uh, economics student at Harvard University to get to know the inventor of the gross domestic product, uh, Simon Kuznets, uh, who was a Nobel laureate for his work in national accounts. And I used to go over to his house. Uh, he was an older man, emeritus professor, and I wanted to imbibe wisdom <laughs> from him. And he was a wonderful person. And he emphasized to me, this is not a measure of well-being. Uh, he told me that already uh, more than 40 years ago, emphatically. Uh, and this is very important for us. Economics should have a purpose of human well-being. Uh, that is our telos, if you will, uh, to use an Aristotelian concept. That should be our purpose. Uh, which is to promote not wealth per se, but well-being. As I said, in Adam Smith's time, it made sense to think of the two uh, in, a, in a shared way. But clearly, in a world in which we have more than enough of our needs, but we still have people suffering and we're destroying the environment, we're doing something wrong by uh, chasing GDP. It's a hard battle to get off of that uh, addiction to GDP. Of course, underpinning it is some naivete, some poor teaching in our textbooks, uh, which don't clarify things very well. Uh, a, a little too much confidence in the invisible hand, I must say, because we need a visible hand to help steer us away from the cliffs and from the dangers. And this is part of the story. 
And uh, I work in many ways on trying to expand the measurement. I am co-editor of the World Happiness Report each year, which is a direct measure of subjective well-being using a Gallup survey data uh, technology called uh, the, and, uh, a specific measure called the Cantrell Ladder, which asks people about their subjective evaluation of quality of life around the world. And that's very indicative. And of course, the OECD has been publishing each year a How's Life Index showing multiple dimensions of well-being or harm. Uh, and uh, we can see this massive divergence between what we're measuring, what we're chasing, and what we really want. Uh, and I'm unfortunately living in the country that is probably most addicted in the world to the GDP concept. Uh, but it's clear the United States has had more than a tripling of GDP per capita, but uh, a decline in the subjective well being during that period. And now we have rising GDP and falling life expectancy. And that was true even before COVID. So it's more than ever urgent that we create better metrics and that we keep in mind why we're in this to begin with, and that is for human well being. You mentioned the, the importance of education and, and changing this, this process. You may or you may not be aware that UHI has a, an interdisciplinary online degree programme in sustainable development. And we've had a, a question in asking, in your opinion, what should the essential elements be that we're teaching our students in this area of sustainable development? Ah, wonderful. That's a favourite topic of mine. Uh, and uh, I, when I came to Columbia uh, 19 years ago, I asked to be uh, given the title Professor of Sustainable Development. There wasn't one. Uh, there wasn't a department. Uh, they said, what's that? I said, well, we'll find out. <laughs> and uh, now at Columbia, we have an undergraduate major, many master's degrees and a PhD in sustainable development. So the 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 point is to both understand the interconnections of multiple systems, the earth physical systems, the engineered systems for how we uh, use energy, for example, as I've been talking about, and the social, political, and economic systems, because these are all complex interconnected processes and sustainable development as an intellectual field is the study of the natural, the engineered, the social, political, and economic systems in an integrated manner. As a uh, normative field, it is to design the policies, the moral guidelines, uh, the uh, educational approaches to help move the world to sustainable development. So I believe that this is a normative field. Uh, it's a field that should have clear objectives, ethical perspectives, and uh, a, a, an actual policy desire. Sometimes economics is said, oh, we, we just, we're, we're so-called positive economics. We're just trying to understand I don't feel that that should be true of economics, but I certainly don't feel that it's true of uh, sustainable development. It's for a purpose, just like the field of public health is for the purpose of healthier populations, not just the study of disease after all, it's for the promotion of health. I think the field of sustainable development should be for the promotion of sustainable development after all. Uh, and so trying to identify the political, financial, social, ethical, uh, educational uh, ways to actually shift how we live uh, and how our uh, various uh, uh, political and, and economic systems function. Thank you. You talk about this importance of interconnection and working across uh, disciplinary and organizational and, and indeed national uh, boundaries. 
we've had another question come in that asks a little bit more about a, another connection that we probably need to consider, and that is an intergenerational uh, consideration. And the, the question is around how can our students of today have an impact in their local communities, which will help shape the wider world in a more sustainable future. So here we're talking across generations and across local and international uh, uh, dimensions. I'm just wondering if you have any sagely advice for our, for our young people. Just to say uh, that um, when sustainable development was first introduced to the world as a concept in 1987 uh, by the Brundtland Commission, it was stated as an intergenerational social compact that is uh, enabling the current generation to meet its needs in a way that will uh, permit future generations to meet their needs. So it was stated intergenerationally. Since then, it has been expanded in concept, I think in a correct way to be the integrated economic, social and environmental vision. And it has been expanded to ensure a global vision because I don't know how many times we need to be uh, informed of it. We need a full, global perspective, practically speaking and ethically speaking. I think COVID helps to remind us that the cliche that we are not safe unless everyone is safe is literally the case on our planet. And we should be acting on that moral wisdom in a very practical way as well. Now for people in local communities, every one of our communities needs to rethink how we are going to live in the coming years, how we're going to adjust to a decarbonized society, how we're going to live better in a digital world, because that's gonna change our lifestyles, our living patterns, our transport patterns, and the rest. In New York City, there's, a, of course, a tremendous uh, and intensive discussion on these issues, but I'd say every community should be having uh, an SDG plan at a community level. And SDG 4 calls on all schools, that is from pre-K through primary and secondary, as well as university. And I would say the School of Public Life, public education for adult and continuing education in society to be teaching and training in sustainable development and one of the assignments I would like to give young people in secondary school, for example, is to ask secondary school students to come up with a plan for how their community can be decarbonized, what kind of energy system, uh, incorporating electri electric vehicles and so forth, because young people are gonna come up with good plans and we need that kind of creative work everywhere and i think it's extremely engaging and also extremely exciting i uh, want to thank you i'm going to have to uh, go because uh, i have someone waiting on the other zoom <laughs> so uh, if you'll permit me to uh, say a huge thanks for including me uh, in uh, in the 10th anniversary and in this lecture and to say how much i've enjoyed being with you Thank you very much indeed. As you can guess, there are many more questions that, that have came in that we've time for. But for the moment, thank you very much indeed. And can I hand back to our Vice Chancellor just to say a few words, please? Or back to you. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. I know you have to go. I just wanted to say, look, you pay us a wonderful compliment with your presence here today. I know you're a very busy person. Um, it's been wonderful to meet you and to hear your insights and expertise, and we wish you all the rest of all the best for the rest of your day. Thank you thank and you. to all of you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Bye-bye. Sure. Okay. I think we can now uh, turn to our esteemed panel. We have three on our panel. Tim Camelius, Chief Executive Officer of Global Energy Group. We have uh, Sharon Flega, 
consultant for pharmaceutical public health at NHS Ireland. And we have Des Thompson, Professor Des Thompson, Principal Advisor on Science and Biodiversity at Nature Spot. And I, th I think the areas that these individuals represent of, of energy, of health, and conservation and biodiversity are, are subjects that we've already touched on. So before going into any more detailed questions, can I just ask each of you, perhaps uh, starting with Des, just ask for your reflections on what we've just heard and whether you have any challenges or comments that you would like to make, particularly for a Scottish perspective, and given that we'll soon be hosting COP26. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, I found that a, an utterly inspirational lecture. And I, I mean, the, the five points that Geoffrey gave us uh, absolutely resonate widely and all have to be taken forward to the, the COP26, which is just months away. But I'm struck by something Geoffrey said at the very end. We need to find a path to justice. We need to find a path to justice. And when you think about justice, you think about justice in, in environmental terms, as I do, but of course, also socially and economically. And what I found so revealing about his presentation, about his lecture, was that he was so open to these different parts of justice. Justice is so important. When we think about the impact that COVID has had, had on us and how it has exposed our lack of resilience, justice and tackling the problems ahead through being just is so important. So the message I took from this is to think about environmental, social and economic justice as we moved towards COP26. Thank you very much, Des. Uh, I'll come back to you in, in a moment. Sharon, um, your perspectives on what we've just heard, please. Mm, yeah, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating talk. And, and the five points, um, yeah, just this week, I, I covered three of those in a, a challenge to my own health board about sustainability going forward. But Jeffrey said that our environment is changing and that that change is accelerating. And for me in the health service and in any healthcare around the world, this has a direct and immediate consequence for our patients and our public. Um, just like Des picked up, um, he mentioned the well-being of nations and social justice, which just delighted me because for me at its heart, uh, sustainability means a better quality of life for everybody now and for future generations. And that brought in his intergenerational um, question there. So uh, what I took from that is that for NHS, for healthcare across the world, we need to provide better services for the public, ones that have got a, a reduced impact on our environment, greater efficiency if we're to meet the ever increasing demands that the climate crisis is bringing to our door. And just reflecting on what we've seen with uh, COVID for the last year and a half, we've seen the power of human beings during COVID with our continual ability to lead, to innovate and to solve problems. And for me, the climate crisis is pandemic plus, but I know that we now have the power and the skills to tackle that. So he said it was urgent that we get on with this. And I think that the next de decade presents us with a unique opportunity, a decade of real action to heal our planet, have justice right across the board and to have well-being of our population. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much indeed. Tim, can I come to you? To you, Sharon and Des have both highlighted the clarity and resonance of those five points, and Sharon's focused it into the next decade being of paramount importance. How, how do you reflect on what we've just heard? Well, pick, picking up an obvious bias to, to to what we do and to my background, it was very much around Scottish innovation, um, and there was a lot of uh, reference, obviously historic. Um, to where, to where Scotland has obviously led uh, innovation, which has had a global impact. And we, we do tend to, to spend an, a, a lot of time and quite rightly so lambasting ourselves for a lot of damage that, that has been done post the, the sort of the industrial revolution. But on the flip side, um, if you actually look at where we are right now, uh, once again, it's, it's Scottish innovation, uh, a lot of technology transfer, which is being taken from oil and gas, which is actually driving towards some of the cleaner solutions, which are going to provide us with all the opportunities um, that we're going to, to, to have to take uh, in order to 
even get close to delivering on many of the mandated um, targets that have been set both by Scottish and UK government. Um, and that obviously goes some way to, to trying to, to contain or at least uh, obtain the, you know, the, the very lofty goal of, of limiting climate change to, to, to that 1.5 degrees. Um, so for me, what, what really struck at home was uh, a theme of Scottish innovation around um, technology transfer. He referenced probably two areas that we're particularly interested in, um, moving skills. And, and there, was, there was many references to, to the need for sort of education and training. So moving those skills from oil and gas into, into more of the renewable sphere, uh, but also then making use of existing technologies, technologies we already have um, uh, in, in order to, to achieve significant goals. I was very pleased to hear him talk about the, the marine industry. Um, so th then going into to power to X, which is a big area that we have to tackle. But but once again, Scotland is at the lead. So um, obviously, co colleagues on the call that very much uh, aligned with how impressed I was um, with the, uh, the the depth um, of, uh, of of his delivery. But uh, for me particularly, it was uh, all around Scottish innovation and uh, harnessing the existing opportunities that we have, given the uh, the, the, the forefront position that Scotland has taken for the last 30 years, uh, especially in the uh, in the subsea technology market. Thank you. You've taken us uh, down a road uh, beyond words and into actions. You've indicated where uh, the roles we could, we could play through innovation and, and technology transfer. And I think that's, that's really useful. You've given us some good examples there. Des, can I come back to you, first of all, to the highlights from a, a conservation and a biodiversity uh, perspective. What, are there any examples or, that you can give us of action that Nature Scotland or, or other organisations have that can put a little bit of flesh on this, that can make these concepts real and on the ground? Well, uh, Tim absolutely mentions innovation and technological stroke scientific innovation. I mean, I'd point to the role of nature, the nature-based solutions. Nature can play a huge role in helping us, uh, for instance, enhance our carbon sinks. You look at the work we're doing in the peatlands, peatland restoration, Scottish government, um, you know, providing a quarter of a billion pounds for peatland restoration over the next decade. We've got to lock up the carbon. And across our entire land and seascapes, we can see work we can do to devise nature-based solutions to tackle the climate emergency, but to also halt the loss of biodiversity. And I, you know, I, I thought Geoffrey touched on this a couple of times, and he mentioned the COP15 as well for biodiversity, which is so important. We have to work with and for nature to tackle the climate emergency. We can't separate them. And you know, I come back to justice and environmental justice. It is so important. We've got to put right the awful things that have happened in the past. And we can only do that collectively and locally. Thank you, Des. And I guess one of the points you're making there is that by taking action in one area may actually yield benefits in, in others yes. as well. In terms of these, these actions, is there anything you'd like to highlight from a, an NHS or a health perspective about action on the ground? Yeah, and Des, you've put that beautifully about biodiversity and, and working with nature to improve health. So I, I'm not going to go any deeper into that subject, but it's, it's one that's right in the middle of my heart. What I will say is that I absolutely agree that biodiversity is really important. And I think the challenge for the health service is that we are part of the problem. We are polluting our biodiversity, but we're actually also part of the solution. And um, my focus is specifically on pharmaceutical pollution, because we know that nearly every contact with the health service, someone leaves with a medicine. And when we pee and poo those medicines down our toilets, they end up in eventually in our rivers and our oceans if the wastewater treatment plants can't deal with them and they can't deal with all of them. So some progress that we've made in NHS Highland, um, we, we worked with yourself, Stuart, at the uh, Environmental Research Institute and we um, became lucky enough to be able to undertake the Alliance for Water Stewardship accreditation. 
Now, in the NHS, we're serious about water. We need water for everything in life. Um, we can't live without water. So we have a social responsibility um, to protect our water. So we achieved that accreditation and our hospital in Caithness um, became the first hospital in the world to be accredited. And out of that has fallen a really exciting action plan for us. Um, lots of things from greening our formulary to doing waste amnesties, people returning their medicines to the right place, um, to using green based, blue based nature solutions like Des mentioned. So it's a lot of work going on in NHS Highland in partnership with yourselves and the One Health Breakthrough Partnership. And I can put a link um, in the uh, chat to that in just one moment. Please do, please do. Time, time's running short, folks, uh, and I, but I think we could have a discussion that ran on for, for a long time. But let me just uh, start to wrap up with the context for the discussion today. And it was a prelude to COP26. Tim, you're, you're a very focused, direct man. Can I ask, are you optimistic, pessimistic, realistic about what can be achieved at COP26? Tell us where you are on this one. Uh, cautiously optimistic, um, which is a real fence-setting statement for me and for those that, that uh, of you that know me well. Um, I, I expect um, it'll be lofty in ambition, whether it can be delivered or not. Um, obviously, TBC. What I would say, though, which I'm uh, ferociously optimistic about, we've we've never seen uh, a level of consciousness, gen genuine consciousness, um, when it comes to how money is being spent now uh, in relation to, to, to energy and, and, and energy generation going forward. Uh, and in, in, in the 20 years that I've been working in the renewable space, I've, I've never seen such a dedication to investment. Um, I've never seen so much money flowing into the sector. Uh, and I've never seen so much importance being placed on the triple bottom line. Um, so regardless of what politicians uh, are able to, 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 to solve uh, in Glasgow, and of course we hope that it's, uh, it's, it's profound, uh, I, I would say that the investment industry is at least providing um, the rest of us with an opportunity to, 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 to get on with it, um, and so therefore cautiously optimistic. Thank you. Sharon, cautiously optimistic? Are you more optimistic yeah. or less optimistic? No, I, I am optimistic, actually. Um, as I said, I think I'd like to see more of a focus on biodiversity, um, but maybe that will happen between COP15 and COP26. But, you know, the pandemic has got all countries talking about recovery, about building back better and greener. And I think that people will come to COP with a greater focus because, after all, as I said, climate change is pandemic plus. And we have seen that power that we've got as human beings. So I am cautiously optimistic that people will be fired up post pandemic um, to, to tackle this. Thank you. Dennis, could you bring us to a, to a close? Are you, you are an optimistic man. Uh, well, I, I am an, an, I'm an optimist and I am optimistic. I'm, this is the last chance saloon. We, we've got to make it happen. And my goodness, we're so lucky. It's in Glasgow. So we're, we're right there at the centre here. And I think University of the Highlands and Islands has a key role to play here in inspiring people to behave differently, to operate differently. And, and dare I say it, the UHI is all lead, already leading the way brilliantly. So the universities and the next generation have to be at the heart of this. We have to be optimistic, but really it's it's center place in the political agenda now. So we have to make it work. And remember COP26 is the beginning. It's the beginning of the new journey we're on. Yes, Sharon, Tim, thank you very much indeed. There's lots more questions and we could extend the discussion. Oh, sorry, we've got to keep it uh, so short. But a huge thank you uh, for your time and, and for your contributions and for your thoughts and opinions. It's very much appreciated. And I now hand over to Dr. Fiona McLean. Fiona's recently been appointed as our new rector, and she's going to wrap up proceedings tonight. Fiona, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Well, what an outstanding event for the UHI annual lecture in its 10th anniversary year. And as Stuart said, all that remains for me is to thank once again Professor Geoffrey Sash, whose inspirational and frankly brutally honest talk simulated such interesting discussion for, from our panellists, who I would also like to thank. Tim Cornelius, 
Professor Des Thompson and Shan Flager. Ably chaired, of course, by Professor Stuart Gibb with some really outstanding questions. Again, thanks very much to Dr. Betsy Parker, who facilitated the event, and to our fantastic events team who organised everything and, and made it all work for us in the end. And a special thank you in particular to you, the audience, for your questions and for joining us. It's been great having you. As well as the annual UHI lecture, we also organise other events that you can join throughout the year. Um, and that includes our next event, which is our, our um, inaugural professorial lecture. And the details are just up here now. Um, Women and Men of the Viking Age, um, an inaugural professor professorial lecture from Professor Alexandra Sandmark. It's going to be on Thursday the 16th September at 4 p.m. So please do join us. Um, it'd lovely to see you at that event as well. And thank you all and good evening.